Now, I'm going to begin with a brief history of relevant facts about the Rodman Dam that we'll, and we'll use a timeline to do that and show some of these significant background events. It'll show problems with the dam, but it'll also show who has the ability to correct the problems. So let me start with this timeline, if we could, Josh. Yeah, yeah, there we go. That first date you see, of course, is when the dam was completed in 1968. Significantly, uh, in 1971, the dam, or the March Canal was halted by a federal court order as a result of an FDE lawsuit. Shortly after that, in 1971, President Richard Nixon stopped the cross Florida Barge Canal construction by executive order. So both of those significant events in 1971. Then I'm going to jump to 1986 when President Reagan signed legislation deauthorizing a portion of the Barge Canal. The next significant event, I think, is in May of 1990 when Senator Bob Graham and Congressman Buddy McKay got a bill passed in Congress that deauthorized the entire cross Florida Barge Canal. That was signed by President Bush in 1990. In 1991, Governor Childs signed a Florida legislation that deauthorized the canal. And then in 1995, he directed the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to move forward with river restoration. The first significant document that I'm gonna show you, I don't think has ever been seen by the public or the press. And that's a communication from Jerry Klutz, the ranger of the Ocala National Forest, dated February 21st, 1996. Can we go to pertinent portions of that, Josh? Can you blow that up? There we go. As you can see, Ranger Klutz has responded to something from the DEP. And it, it says, it, he re reports that dated January 24, 94, the DEP planned to remove the west end of the Rodman Dam from National Forest Service lands. That's something that's been advocated for decades, but the Forest Service agreed with that, but noted that your, their SUP expired on December 31st, 1998. Now that's a significant date and we're gonna talk about that some more. But despite the fact that both the state of Florida and the Forest Service have uh, kind of followed the SUP, it was never renewed, and that's significant. And you'll see that one of the things that Ranger Klutz proposed in his response was not that they just remove a thousand feet of the dam from the spillway, but to remove all of it from Forest Service lands. Essentially, they were trespassing on Forest Service lands. And the only way they could do that was with an SUP. Let's go to the next document, Josh. Okay, if you look at this document, what you see in green is all Forest Service land. Everything to the left of that document is Forest Service land. And the Rodman Pool and the, and the dam structure are on Forest Service land, which under common law would allow the Forest Service to remove that structure anytime they wanted to. They own it, but they granted an SUP to allow the state to use it, but that expired in 1998. So from 1998 forward, the Forest Service had the ability, authority, and legal right to remove that earthen dam and reduce the hazard of dam failure and restore the river. Next document, please, Josh. Now, this special years permit is very interesting. Let's go to the next part of that's highlighted, Josh. What it, it provided in part that upon ex, it, when it expired, that the permit expiring on December 31st, 1998, that it would require, not require notice of the decisions document. In other words, expired then without notice. Go to the next one, please. More importantly, should zoom in on that top part? Okay, that's fine. If you look at the removal of the impoundments, what it essentially says is that if you do not renew the SUP, then the dam can be removed by the Forest Service. We already knew that, but this, this documents that. And it's in the SUP that uh, expired in 1998. Next document, please. Yeah, that's it. Let's go. Okay. That, well, we got on that on the SUP. 
Oh, we had another part of that highlighted, maybe not. In any event, uh, the next thing I wanna talk about occurred in December 17, 2001. And this was a record of decision by the US Forest Service. And in this document, if I can see that, Josh, the pertinent language in this document provides that the Forest Service, uh, that's, there we go, go to the highlighted section, that the Forest Service is still committed to, res to restoration of the river, but only if they reissue the special use permit, which we now know was never done. And so the only way that the impoundment could continue is if progress was being made in accordance with the phase time line that would have restored the river. If the state was showing significant progress towards this restoration, then they could continue with the SUP, but we now know that never happened. So the, the Forest Service is still trying to get in 2001, the state to enter into the, or renew the SUP in, without doing that, then the Forest Service can remove the dam, which we already knew. Then in July of ni July 19, 2002, I think this is a very significant document from the Environmental Protection Agency, Florida Department of, I'm sorry, Florida Department of Environmental Protection. This document provides in part, we have that highlighted, Josh, that the state is committed and Governor Bush is committed to restoration of the river, but they don't have the funds to do it. So they're telling, they're turning it back over to the Forest Service. This action opens the door for the U.S. Forest Service to pursue restoration. I was very surprised to see this document, but it's consistent with what we've been seeing by all the admitted governors of the state of Florida up to this point. And as a matter of fact, every governor up through Governor Christ all the governors of the state of Florida, both Republican and Democrat, have been in favor of restoration of the river until we get to Governor Scott, who was not. I don't know what Governor DeSantis' position is, but because of the significant safety issues we now have, in addition to the environmental issues, I'd be interested to see what he has to say uh, about protecting the public by taking appropriate action to remove the dam uh, and restore the river. So I'm gonna address that again later. Uh, the next document I wanna to refer to is July 27, 2015. Now this is a document that was made public. We've, we obtained this document and reviewed it and became very concerned about some safety issues set forth in this document, which was made public. One section of it specifically provides for a, or addresses a hazard underwater that is identified as significant. Can we go to that one, Josh? When you, when you see the, the highlight to the left, that's underwater one, and to the right is the level of concern, and that's underwater four. Well, what that means, it has to be immediately corrected. Interestingly, we were told that none of these corrections, these numerous faults in the dam identified in 2015, were ever corrected. No money was ever spent to correct these problems. So we became concerned and we decided to go look at the 2017 report and the 2019 report that we knew had to be there because of the ongoing obligation of, you're getting ahead of me, partner, <laughs> the ongoing obligation of the state to inspect the dam every two years and provide information to the Forest Service and to correct any problems that occur. Well, the 2017 report and the 2019 report were never made public. Nobody's ever seen we, we were finally able to obtain them through a Freedom of Information Act request. And when we obtained them, we learned there were additional structural problems identified in those reports. We became increasingly concerned about a potential breach of the dam. All these old earthen dams are subject to catastrophic failure, especially ones that are constructed of sand. I knew that and it caused me great concern and it caused FDE great concern that there was a significant hazard as a result of potential breach of the dam. So we hired a, a 
very well-known engineering company out of Texas. We interviewed several around the country. These individuals, these engineers had particular expertise in earthen dams. So we hired them and they looked at the 2015, 2017 and 2019 reports and they issued a report in February of this year, which we will be sharing with everyone. Let's go to that, Josh. Now they didn't actually go to the dam. They just analyzed <clears throat> what the reports had shown previous to that. Let's go to the first section of that so we highlight Josh. <clears throat> In this section, and I'm going to have to come up because I'm too far from the screen to read this. Why don't you hand me a copy of that, Josh, and I can read it without, without slowing down here. Uh, GE, GEI identified additional problems in the dam in addition to what were in the reports and also was critical of a lack of appropriate action and investigation. And you can see this better than I can. But one of the things that was really concerned us was that the dam had been classified as low hazard, which doesn't require the same degree of scrutiny as a high hazard dam. But that didn't make sense because there was a hazard report in 2007. So that the evaluation of the dam in 2015, 17, and 19 did not was not as thorough as it should have been with a high hazard dam. Go to the next one, please, Josh. Also, GEI identified particular areas of concern leading to a potential breach and piping failure is one of those. And they, they, ex, they go forward and explain it and how that occurs uh, and how in these old earthen dams, especially ones who conducted of sand, that there is a potential for catastrophic failure, which you will not recognize in advance. You don't know necessarily hours before, minutes before the failure. Sometimes you do. And we're not saying that this dam is about to fail, but we are saying it is subject to catastrophic failure. And catastrophic failure of this dam has catastrophic consequences. Next, next, Josh. Now, there are two options to correct the problem. They're set forth in the report. Let's go on to the next document, Josh. One is to spend millions of dollars on band-aids for this aging dam. Might work, might not. It would give it some additional useful life, but th this dam's age and construction, that's temporary at best. The other one is to remove a portion of the dam and restore the river. And that has two options. One is to remove the control structure, which the state could do, and that's the least expensive. And the other is to remove the earthen dam, which the Forest Service could clearly do. Either one of those would be a permanent solution and it would restore the river as well. But either one of those solutions, next document, either one of those solutions would require an immediate drawdown. Now that doesn't cost anything. The hazard of this dam could be eliminated very quickly by a gradual and permanent drawdown. Wouldn't cost anything. Now that wouldn't restore the river. That would have to be done later where you would come back and remove the control structure and or a portion of the earthen dam. So where are we? Well, if we summarize this briefly, what we now know is that the Robin Dam has structural problems that were recognized in 2015, 2017 and 2019 the last two never been made public, available to the public. And we, we had a respected earthen dam engineering company that tells us that our concerns were valid and posed a substantial risk to the public in portions of Putnam, in portions of Putnam County. Josh, can you show me the inundation graphs? One of the things in the GEI report or inundation table graphs or inundation maps. And what they show us is the area that would be flooded by breach of the dam. Now here's one of them. And there's actually two. Can I see the second one? Now both, well, that's that's this is actually very interesting. This is not from GEI. This is from the 2015 report. And it's hard to see the inundation area, 
But I can tell you that in this one, it runs all the way from Orange Point to Turkey Island, a very substantial area. Both the state and the Forest Service were on notice of the deficiencies in the dam and the failure to make necessary repairs, but they never told Putnam County about it. The Putnam County officials and threatened members of the public were unaware of the hazard. The unfortunate folks who own property or businesses from Lazy Days Camp Resort in the south to Stevens Point on the north end of the inundation zone that was identified in the GEI report have a double whammy of substantially higher potential flood insurance if they can get it and substantially decreased property values through no fault of their own. Furthermore, they face the constant threat of a failure, which would result in property damages alone of excess of $57 million, not to speak of the loss of life and the dire environmental consequences of a breach. So we knew this from what GEI got of the hazard report in 2007, but in 2015, the report expanded that inundation zone. So what the true value of the property loss and loss of life, environmental damage, I can't tell you all I'm like, no question, it's substantial. Now, undoubtedly, if the Putnam County commissioners had been aware of this flooding hazard, they could have dealt with it, but they were kept in the dark and it continued to be. I don't think they've ever seen that any of these reports, except perhaps 2015. <clears throat> Some of the basic facts that are noteworthy include the fact that it's widely accepted that all earthen dams leak. And as they age, leaking tends to increase, especially earthen dams such as this that are constructed of sand and are over 50 years old. The dam assessment reports of 15, 17, and 19 indicate structural problems. And the, the comprehensive updated evaluation by GEI is critical of the dam condition. The agreement between the Forest Service and the state of Florida was that all the deficiencies in the dam have to be repaired. Well, one of the things we learned from our Freedom of Information request was that no repairs were ever made. No money was ever spent. So all the deficiencies that were identified in 2015, 2017, 2019, and summarized in 2021 are still there. What happens when hurricane season comes? Well, that's something I wouldn't want to face if I lived downstream, and I don't think Putnam County wants to face it. As I've noted, a catastrophic failure of the dam poses substantial loss of life, risk of loss of life, and over $57 million in property damage. In order to protect the public, the dam should be breached and removed. But as I've noted, the simple and effective cost-effective, no-cost means to remove the hazard, at least for now, would be a permanent drawdown before hurricane season, hopefully, but, you know, next week it could begin. And then you don't have the hazard, and then you have time to come back and either remove the control structure or the earthen portions of the dam that's on the Forest Service, or both. Go to Exhibit 20, please. In conclusion, I'd like to remind you of some of the things you've covered. Uh, various members of, of the press have covered, if I can see that. Hey, Jim. Twenty is the, yeah. Okay. Recently, you, as you all are well aware, the Ottawa River was designated as a Florida treasure. And the obsolete dam holding it back prevented the revitalization of the local community, a healthy environment, and Governor Santos has the authority to bring the river back. Now, why do I talk about this? Because the American Rivers named the Ocklawaha River as among the nation's 10 most endangered. And all the governor has to do is proceed with an immediate drawdown, permanent drawdown, no cost to the taxpayers. And while the river won't be restored, at least at that point, the public will be protected and they can move forward restoration. I don't know what Governor DeSantis' position is. I know the DEP is aware of all this. Whether they've told him, I don't know. Sometimes I doubt it. You know, he has taken some pretty aggressive moves to protect the environment. Well, this is another opportunity for the governor, and I expect he'll step up, but we'll see. 
And that's all the comments I have for today. I'm open for questions. And like I say, uh, both Mr. Gross and Professor Little are here to assist me. Do I have any questions at this point? Uh, I'll jump in, Mr. Castor, if I may. Sure. So I, I, I understand that uh, at one point, the uh, Ranger, uh, Jerry Krause, Plus. I think. Plus. Klutz, yes, and I spoke with him in the past, uh, had uh, suggested that the U.S. Forest Service does want the dam removed, as he described there. I'm wondering if there's any indication of their attitude since then about the dam, and then coupled, coupling that with apparently they knew of the structural deficiencies and yet have not responded to them publicly. So that makes me wonder what their attitude today is about the dam. Do you have any insights about that? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I do. You know, some of the documents I've shown you make it clear the Forest Service has paid lip service to river restoration. But what I didn't tell you was on, and you'll need the pictures of Buddy, and, and on May 16, 2016, Buddy McKay, Carol Browder, and John Hankinson went to Washington, D.C. and met with Tom Tidwell, who was head of the Forest Service. And he was adamant in his commitment to restoration of the river. He renewed that commitment to restoration of the river. I think you all are all familiar with Buddy McKay, Carol Browder, and John Hankinson, who were all, you know, notable defenders of the environment in Florida, maybe not members of FDE, but, but people who had long records of, of protecting the environment in Florida. They came back very energized because Tidwell had made a firm commitment to restoration of the river. Apparently he turned that over to the Forest Service in the state of Florida. And for the next four years, they did nothing. That resulted in October 9 of 2017. And it's on the timeline that we'll give you. Professor Little and Jim on behalf of FDE and I sued the Forest Service trying to force them to do what they had committed to do. That litigation is still pending. Uh, judge in Jacksonville dismissed it. Uh, we think clearly wrongfully it's on appeal. We expect it to be reversed and that litigation will continue. And that may force the Forest Service to do what they've claimed they were going to do for over 20 years and have done nothing. We wouldn't have sued them in October of 2017 if there had been any progress as a result of the meeting that Buddy and, and Browder and Hankerson had with Tidwell back in May, when we finally gave up because nothing happened. Hey, Bruce. Uh, hey, Cindy Swarko here. Yes, um, Cindy. Have you shared the your consultant's report with DEP yet, or, or do you plan to soon? I plan to make it public today. I've not shared it with anybody other than FDE uh, and I think that's it, but if it's gone out, it's gone out uh, on a very limited basis, but it will become public today as well the 2017 and the 2019. Those have never seen the light of day. Everything that's been in the PowerPoint that we've shown you today will be made public today, perhaps by you. You'll have access to all of it. You'll have access to this PowerPoint if you want it. You'll have access to the, the dam assessment reports, anything else that you want. How, how long did it take you from the time you made the, the public records request with DEP to when they produced it? I'd have to go back and look exactly, but it was very frustrating. It was months. Uh, it was months before we finally got it. And I got to run around, I'll tell you, I guess that's typical. I've not done one of these before. And so I assume that's what happens, but uh, I will just tell you it took forever. But finally, we were turned over to an attorney with DEP who was very thorough and very cooperative and gave us everything, but it, it, it was pulling teeth. Uh, this is Kevin Spear again. Um, I wonder if you might characterize what you think of DEP's actions here then in light of these hazards uh, that your consultant spelled out. Is it a dereliction of duty or an active cover up or I don't want to put words in your mouth. You know, please characterize what, how you think they've behaved in this. I would not pretend to get in the head of DEP, but I think both. It is apparently a cover-up or incompetence. It's hard to say. 
but shouldn't the public have been alerted to these? And why would we have to struggle so hard to get them? Why didn't they make them public like they did the 2015? You know, I guess partly because they never spent the money to fix what was wrong in 2015 and haven't spent a dime since. So they just let the public be at risk. Now, you make your own judgment about that. I find it disgraceful. So uh, aside from making it public now, where does FDE go with this? Well, the simple answer to that is the DEP now will have to face the fact that the public knows what they knew. And then I would assume they would take the responsible action and immediately begin a drawdown of the pool to protect the public. Maybe they won't. Then they open themselves up to all sorts of problems. I'd hate to think about the tragedy of the dam breach, the loss of life, the loss of property, and the terrible environmental consequences. And who would a lawyer go looking to? I'd be looking at the DEP, and I'd be looking at the Forest Service. Either one of them could have fixed this problem and refused to do it. You know, the Forest Service is well aware of this as the DEP. They were getting these reports. They were mandated to be received. And it was mandated that the problem must be fixed. So I, I don't know, but I assume the Forest Service is aware, as I am now, that none of the problems were fixed. I mean, they don't have to do a freedom of administration request to get the data like we had to do. I'm sorry, I, I guess I wasn't clear. Where does Florida Defenders of the Environment go with this now? I misunderstood you. I'm sorry. No, 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 that's fine. And I'm not even I, wearing a mask. <laughs> yeah, I understood DEP, so I'll go back to FDE. That's a very good question. Uh, I have some advice for them that I have not shared yet, and I, I can't do that here. But I would tell you that FDE, who have been committed to this since the 1960s, are not going to give up. And they'll do whatever it takes to force this issue. But if we'll start with allowing the governor time to do the right thing. And we won't take any action until he's had an opportunity to receive this information, which he should have and may have. I don't know if DEP has been keeping him up to speed. Once the governor has this information, I would say the first thing is go to him and say, what are you going to do? And if he does like Scott and says nothing, I'll do nothing, or just doesn't do anything, then we'll have to discuss, decide our options then. But we're not going away. Am I, am I correct about that, Professor Little? Bruce, uh, you're certainly correct about that. As you've said, um, FDE has been involved in this since the 60s. FDE started this, as you well know, through the efforts uh, initially of uh, Marjorie Harris Carr, David Anthony, and other people who unfortunately are no longer with us. I've been with it for 50 years now. I think you've been with it almost as long. And I hope we are having some new generations come along uh, that will follow in our feet, so that footsteps, so that if need be, we'll go for another 50 years. But this is the time to do it. Uh, and I'm hoping that this uh, report that you've been primarily instrumentally, uh, instrumental in making uh, will in fact tip the scales so that the politicians have the scales on their eyes removed and we'll do something. <clears throat> Let me mention, uh, you mentioned um, John Hankinson and Buddy and Carol Browner. Uh, John Hankinson, one time, you may remember, was an executive director of FDE. Uh, and uh, of course, Buddy was a member and a supporter for all these uh, times. Carol Browner was always a supporter, as you've said. Whether she was ever an official member, I'm not sure. Maybe Jim Gross would know that. Uh, hey, got any other questions before we conclude? Yeah, Professor Little, this is Kevin Spear at the Orlando Sentinel. And I wonder if you might share your sense of how DEP and the Forest Service have behaved with respect to these reports and the hazards they detail. Well, I would not disagree with the uh, characterization made by Bruce here. Uh, 
I think it's a, a matter of um, political unwillingness to do something that somebody thinks might cost them a vote or two, not bearing in mind that to do it will probably gain them thousands of votes uh, or could gain them thousands of votes, not only in this area, but uh, also throughout the state of Florida. Uh, F, uh, sorry, the DEP has been um, unusually recalcitrant, and that's very hard for me to understand. This is a public agency, presumably with a public mission to uh, the pe people of the state of Florida. So it's not been a pretty picture. Uh, Forest Service for the last four years has been under the realm of a very un- what? Un- um, uninterested, I put it that way, administration. We've got a new administration now, and we're hoping as within a short time that the uh, a, di a different attitude will seep into that administration of the Forest Service. Uh, so we'll see. Thank you. I do have one last question, but I don't want to monopolize this. Um, uh, well, I'll go ahead. So, uh, and, and this is kind of a, it goes into the details a little bit, but I think I understood that an emergency plan was developed for a dam classified as a low hazard dam. And that suggests to me that maybe they were hedging their bets. They were acknowledging that this is a, a problem potentially, but they didn't want to classify it so, but still they uh, went ahead with an emergency plan. Have you drawn details from that emergency plan that sort of back up your your sense of things here, Mr. Castor? Yeah, that's addressed in the GEI report, but the most important thing is the fact that it is a high hazard dam, which completely changes the perspective and the requirements for what you do to protect the public. That's the most significant part of it, quite frankly. I'm on a okay. call, is he on the call now? All right. Okay. If there's no further questions, yeah, let me let me ask one more thing. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a month or so ago, now you folks had that that presentation about kind of a, a way of of working together with the different groups, like you know the fishers and everybody else. How, how's that seem to be going going on now? Well, I have to tell you, I'm not involved in that. Yeah, at the fringe of the Ottawa, but Jim Gross can address that better than I can, Jim. Yeah, that's um, that's a good question, Cindy. Um, and the, the answer, the quick answer is it's going rather well. Um, it's a an, an effort that's uh, focused on communications uh, to to um, largely focusing on our, our elected officials. But the support that we're getting from the public right now is just astounding. Um, we've got more than 22,000 people signed up to, uh, uh, to a letter to the governor saying the time is now let's move forward with what's right for Florida and get our river back so I think it's it's going really well uh, we're focusing on communications um, primarily with elected officials hoping to see some some action even th this year uh, from the governor in the forms of a, a form of, a, of an executive order to do the kinds of things that Bruce has just just mention and hopefully even go farther than that. I have a question for you, Jim. Isn't that group, that Friends of the Oktawaha group, doesn't that consist of a lot of scientists as well as lay people? Well, that's a good question, Bruce. Yes, absolutely. There are teams that have been assembled uh, to look at different issues, uh, to look at scientific issues. We've got a, an all-star team of PhD scientists from across Florida. Um, and then there are economists that are looking at the economic aspects of it. Um, and so it's, it's a multi-pronged effort looking at all aspects of it. And the bottom line is, is that this is a very bright and cheerful message that's coming out from all of this very detailed and rigorous work. And that it's, it's going to be good for Florida to um, move forward with restoration of the Ocklawa. It makes economic sense. It makes ecological sense. It makes water resources sense. So it's just, it's something that's, the time is now. 